So we'll start with recalcitrant vaginal infections, and we'll go from the frequently irritating infections uh, to the, the serious, serious major problems, and we'll talk about uh, those later in the day. The recalcitrant vaginal infections, it, and, you know, I do infectious disease. Infectious disease, there are probably 15 of us that were trained officially. I was the first fellow. I was at Baylor. We were at Baylor because Baylor's where Herman Gardner did his research. And uh, so when they came to starting a fellowship, the first fellowship went to Texas, and it was a choice between Dallas and, and Houston because of uh, Gardner. It went to Houston. Uh, I was the first fellow. We had lots of fun. Before that, you either had to do maternal fetal medicine uh, and, and Parkland, or you had to go to, or you had to do an internal medicine residency and an OBGYN residency, and then do an internal medicine fellowship. And my first year was an internal medicine infectious disease fellow, fellow, and then switched over, and then another year of maternal fetal medicine. It worked well <coughs> for about three, four years, <coughs> excuse me. And then Medine came to me and said, he says, Mark, you're, you're not making money like an OBGYN, you're making money like an internist. He says, that's because that, that's, that's where the billing codes were and everything was like that. And he says, I need you. I said, I have 23 departments, only seven make money. OBGYN's one of them. You've got to make money. And I had a 10-person division. He said, you've got to start, start, stop seeing vaginitis in the office and start operating on people because you don't operate a lot on vaginitis people. You shouldn't. <laughs> and uh, I said, no, I love this, and I want to keep doing, continue to do that. And he says, well, you'll continue to be paid as an internist then. So I did that for a few years and decided if I wanted to make money, I had to be a chairman. And then when people told me, that division doesn't make money. I said, well, it doesn't make a difference. I'm the, I'm the chair, so we'll have one. That lasts for about five years, and the dean gets sick, sick of it and, you know, hires an oncologist. Like, luckily, I think they're, they're gone today, so they're not going to pick on me. So um, right now, I have a small practice. <clears throat> I still go to, back to Oklahoma. I'm a, and <clears throat> there's left over and see some patients because I feel I have to, and I've got a three-month wait because there are a lot of patients out there, and it, only because the, we'll talk the last test, the last lectures about the labs, the labs don't help you, so you're stuck with these patients who have these infections that they go over and over again. And our knowledge, our limit of, uh, of knowledge is really stuck in the old days. I argue with the CDC, luckily the new director um, for the, the STD and vaginal infections was a former patient of mine when I was at Emory, and she says, it's not that we're not trying, it's just that there's so few of you and, and we do everything on evidence-based and you're not doing all, all the research. It's hard for us to do the research because um, you know, the NIH put some money into, into it. There's a small grant for vulvodynia we're getting this year. The grants for VV have stopped, and, and so there's not a lot of research. So the CDC stuck with not a lot of uh, re research on uh, evidence-based research. The reason we're stuck is because we're all stuck in the, probably basically the 60s and the 70s, where you see a patient with a, vagina, a, vag, you know, a vaginal discharge, and you're, you're stuck with, does she have yeast? Does she have trick? Or if you look under the microscope and there's no yeast there and there's no trick there and it looks abnormal, it must be bacterial vaginosis. What are you left with? Well, if you're, if you're thinking maybe there's a dual infection, that there's yeast and a, and, um, and a BV infection, that's great. Uh, and then for menopausal women, it's atrial vaginitis. But you're not stuck with a lot of diagnosis. This, fortunately, makes up 92% of the vaginal discharges, the vaginal infections. But there's 8% that don't. And again, if you're seeing... If you're seeing 20 patients a day, eat minimally, easily, you know, something 30 or 40, so 100 patients a week, statistically about 20 or 30 of those will have a discharge. You know, you're, lo you're, you're left with 15 to 20 patients a week that are not in this category that you don't, and, and there's no laboratory that's allowed to help you. It, by the end of the day, well, I, remember we, I do this every year, but different, different topics, uh, you know, I want us to be chanting, insurance companies are evil and laboratories are their henchmen. Because you know, they don't help you with this. They actually say, we have to save money. The insurance companies want us to be cheap. We're going to be cheap, you know, where it doesn't matter. So we can't skimp on oncology and HIV and stuff like that. He says, but vaginal infections aren't going to kill anybody and, we, and we're not going to cover them. We're not going to take care of them. Uh-oh. I think it's, I'm stuck with something. Anyway, let's start with, 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 with yeast. Again, 92% of your problems are going to be simple. With yeast, it's about 85% uh, or 80%. When you look at when I take 111 isolates out of, a, out of a routine practice, it used to be 
that 95% of them were candidate applicants and a simple candidate applicants. Now, because of things that I and other people have done, it's changed, uh, and about 15% of them are candidate glabrata, or used to be tori lapsus glabrata, or again, 20, about 20% are non-albican strains. The problem with the non-albican strains is that they don't make hyphae. You can't see them under the microscope. Uh, they look like little white cells. I have some nice pictures that I've enhanced with all kinds of special dyes, you know, so you can see, and I'm used to this, but you can't see it, and 50% of the time, under the microscope, pathologists, pap smears, you know, uh, uh, other, other specialists, look, they can't tell, they can't find. 50% of the time, you can't see, see the yeast, because candida albicans are dimorphic. They have a hyphal stage and a, and a cellular stage. Unless you see those hyphae, those pseudo-hyphae, you really can't, you can't tell. Laboratories can't tell, so you're stuck. When I wrote the technical bulletin for, for ACOG, you know, I basically said that, you know, 50% of the time, and the, and the statistics show 50% of the time you're not going to see hyphae even though there is a yeast infection. So if it looks like a yeast, smells like a yeast, acts like a yeast, treat, treat for yeast. I then went on to say, and if you do this twice and you can't get the answer, do a culture. The ACOG Technical Bulletin Committee basically said, the lawyer said, don't say you have to, because if you say you have to and you don't do it, then, then you get stuck with the legal, medical legal thing. And, and I said, just, just yeast. It doesn't make that. They said, just don't do it. I said, fine. So you'll, you'll see the wording both at the CDC and the ACOG. They strongly recommend that you do this, or they, uh, they suggest that you do this, or they say you, and the last, the last default thing is that they, the CDC, discussing with Kimberly Wachowski is in charge, she says what they do is they, they, they ask you to defer to a specialist, which there really aren't a lot of specialists around. There are probably five people doing this full time across the country right now. Okay, so this is what Tori Lopsis glabrata, Candida glabrata looks like. You don't see hyphae. This is a bunch of it. This is the worst case, okay? This is a lot of, a, 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 a lot of yeast cells. And so if you see, but look how high I am in magnification. And, most, and this is because I have a special micro, microscope. You're higher than your higher power. Just in order to see this, I'll show you some other slides where you're not going to be able to see that. Okay, same thing. The one over here in the upper right, I call it the Mickey Mouse sign. You see the little thing with ears on it. It's, it's candida glabrata all the time. The thing is, uh, if it's recurrent, it's generally not recurrent. If it's candida glabrata, it doesn't go away. Nothing, <coughs> not 1% of monostat, clotrimazole, buconazole, not 1% kills it. Uh, so. What happens is they feel better when they're on their seven-day cream, and they say, I felt great. But, you know, a couple of days after I stopped it, it came back. So they, took four, so, so they take 14 days. And again, it doesn't kill it at all. It just covers up the, the, the uh, epithelium. They don't have as much itching and irritation, and they stop. Uh, and then it comes back again. And so they think it's recurrent, but it's really persistent. <coughs> but it's severe. They say you seven and 14 days of uh, topical azole. Uh, or one to four, four days of fluconazole. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, uh, but again, not, that, that won't help. It'll make them feel better. If you get a culture, and I'll show you how difficult it is to get a culture, but if you get a culture um, for uh, Canada albicans, uh, for non Canada albicans species, um, uh, you basically have to use and go longer, but it's not going to work. I guess this is, this is the CDC recommendations. And again, they, 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 just, they, they do that because. What the, you have to ask for, do not use fluconazole. Fluconazole will not touch these. The reason that fluconazole is there, in fact, it's the problem, uh, is because fluconazole was a drug that a company had that said, gee, we got this drug. It doesn't work really well. Um, it doesn't kill very much. In fact, it encourages, enc it encourages uh, uh, Corylopsis glabrata, so we can't use it for our IV therapy. We can't use it on cancer patients. We can't use it here. What can we do with it? We don't want to lose the money on it. And they said, oh, let's make it, let's make, make it a pill and give it to women. That's their actual thinking. Uh, and so they did that. And it, did a, it does a great job, one to three, one, you know, one to two doses uh, for, for typical yeast. But again, 20% of the time, you're not going to have a typical yeast. And what's worse is that 1% of whatever you take generally goes to the vagina. So 99% goes someplace else. 15 to 25% or 15 to 40% goes to the intestinal tract. People who have recurrent vulvovaginal candidiasis don't catch yeast all the time. They just have yeast. 25% of us in, in the audience have yeast in, in our intestinal tracts right now. But we're, we're, we're overwhelmingly outnumbered by all the other bacteria there. 50% of the weight of your stool are bacteria. You have some yeast there because you had bread. You had fresh fruit. 
there's yeast in your intestines, but it's, it's, out, it's out, outnumbered a million to one with other bacteria. Um, you go to the bathroom, uh, you have a bowel movement, you wipe yourself afterwards, you don't steam, steam blast yourself, you know, so you're, you know, even a bidet is not going to help you. So you're going to have um, uh, microscopic yeast there. They go to where it's warm and moist, they go to the vagina, and they sit there, but there's a million to one, 10,000 to one bacteria over yeast, and they can't grow. Yeast are plants, they grow slow. Bacteria are, bacteria are, are, are single cell organisms that grow very fast. But, so they always grow faster. But you take an antibiotic, okay? You wipe out the, you wipe out the, the, uh, the bacteria, and now the yeast say, wow, all this food, which is the glucose that you normally have, your glucose level, that you all have, which is part of your transudate, you say, no, competition, where'd the bacteria go? Time for a party, and then they go crazy. Uh, and that's why people say after an antibiotic, I get a yeast infection. Uh, you could lose, it, it, there, there are other ways to do it, we'll talk, ab talk about it, but that's basically what happened. So now you have in your intestines, 100 different strains of, of yeast, you know, of a couple numbers here and there. So if you're, gonna if you're a woman and you're gonna reinfect yourself, you wipe from front to back, you, you know, we did a study you heard about 15, 20 years ago where you microwave your underwear you just don't do it with synthetic underwear because it catches on fire. Um, you do what we've done all those crazy studies, and and you um, and uh, you do everything you can, but you get a yeast infection. Well, if you're if you're just a normal person, there's a and one percent of the yeast in your vagina are really rare, really hard to kill. Okay, so your chances of getting a, a bad infection are one percent, uh, and when you get that, you take anything, monostat, anything over the counter, and it goes away. But now you've taken um, uh, a couple of diflucan, and, and then what happens is they get better for the first couple of days. So the doctor says, you know, I ask him how many you take. Well, I took one, it was okay. I took one again, it was okay. Then they had me take two, it was okay. You know, so, and then it got, came back, so I took a week's worth, and then I took, you know, two weeks' worth, and a month's worth. And what happens, and I see that patient, I don't even have to do the exam. I know I'm gonna see that slide. And the reason is because now instead of having one in a hundred yeast, all that diflucan is concentrated in the, in the, in the gut, 15 to 40 percent, 40 times more than it's in the vagina, and they kills every easy to kill yeast, and the only yeast that's left there are the really horrible, horrible yeast that nothing kills. 40 days of, you know, 30, 28 days of fluconazole won't kill. When she gets reinfected, she gets reinfected with that strain, and then it doesn't go away. It temporizes it with some over-the-counter stuff, but it never gets uh, done until you take boric acid. And boric acid basically works because it acidifies your vagina. You know, 1950, your grandmother has has, um, has a yeast infection, she doesn't die, she's not miserable, she doesn't stop having sex for the rest of her life, you know, you know be, because, uh, you know, the, sur the, the survival of the human race wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't be there if everybody had a yeast infection never had sex again. So, although it's different in the caveman days, the caveman just hit the woman over the head with a club, dragged her in a cave, didn't matter if she felt good. But, um, but now it's important if you feel good. So, the, um, so the, but you, what your grandmother did is ordered some you know, in the morning, two quarts of milk, and the more milk would come to her, her front doorstep in the little milk box. I remember I, when I was a little kid, I'm not old yet, it was, we weren't horse-drawn dairies, it was a regular car dairy. And they'd come out, and then she'd ask for a quart of yogurt or a pint of yogurt. And that yogurt would be made the day before, teeming with lactobacilli. She'd get lactobacilli, increase her lactic acid, lactic acid pH would go down to under 4 to 3 to 3.5. Yeast cannot, can't live in less than 3.5, and that's why women burn when they have yeast infection. After millions of years of evolution, their body is made to, if they see something that's fungal, they burn because they have, they have extra lactic acid. Well, she got her yeast infection because you gave her an antibiotic. That antibiotic killed, killed her lactobacillus. She doesn't have any lactobacillus. She goes to the grocery store, gets, gets yogurt. The yogurt now, I tested 32 in the store. Only 10% had a little bit of lactobacillus in it, and not enough to help you. Because bacteria live about three days. When it says live in active cultures, activia, you know, that's that. It's only, they give you six of them because only one-tenth of them have, have anything in it. And that's why they tell, tell you to take a month or so to do it. Because maybe one out of ten chance you'll get something in it. And your intestines, it's okay. In your intestines, it'll grow because it's warm and moist and it stays in your body for a while. I mean, vagina, unless your pH is, is low, which it's not because your bacteria then have pH high, you won't grow anything. Plus, it's been sitting, it, the bacteria live for three days, so they made it in Wisconsin, they shipped it to a super center to get uh, distributed to your hometown grocery. It's sitting there for four or five days. Again, nine out of 10, when you pick them up, there's nothing in there. So the old dairy, so your grandma, it was easier for your grandmother. It's harder now to fix all that. 
So, but, so when you get the Toriolopsis, the Candida glabrata, the only cure is boric acid. I've got a patient that's now waiting for two days for a compounding pharmacist to make it. I'm trying to get a website. I was hoping for this meeting to have it up where, where we have a couple of pharmacies that are online people can go to. They're just not ready, ready for multi-state distribution. But I'm, I'm really working on this the next couple of years. If I do, I'll, I'll email, email all of you if you went to this conference. Uh, because the, the, it costs three cents to make. But the pharmacist, compounding pharmacists charge them 80 bucks. You know, and so it, and I, I, I tell them to move around. And, but my nursing staff just is tired of somebody calling them and saying, my pharmacist will make it or it costs 80 bucks. Is there anything else I can use? Um, but 600 milligrams, filled in capsules, in the vagina, twice a day for 14 days. And then I ta taper them down with a refill once a day after that. And it gets rid of, it gets rid of the, the, um, the, um, the Toriolopsis. Now, if she doesn't have a normal vagina and if she doesn't have a lactobacillus back and she still has those in her intestines, she'll get that back. That's more likely to happen if she's taken lots of uh, diflucan. Trichomonas, uh, again, for trichomonas, easy. Most trichomonas, 84% of trichomonas is easy to kill. Is, is, there's not a problem. And the CDC recommends a single dose of 2 grams of metronidazole uh, or tenidazole. We'll talk about the difference. And or twice a day for seven days. The twice a day uh, for seven days gives you about a 92% cure rate. The one, one time oral dose gives you about an 88% 88, 88 cure rate, so there's not much difference, but you get a little better cure rate. The best regimen is what they use in England, and that's two grams on the first day, 12, 12 hours. So, so one gram in the morning, one gram at night, take a day off, so skip a day, and then another, another uh, two grams uh, on the third day. Uh, but people forget that. I had a nice slide where it says, uh, my doctor told me to, to take two pills and skip a day, and the person's on jump rope skipping in the day two, you know, and said, but it's not helping, you know. So, so, so um, but and even the, if they only get one dose in, um, uh, they still get a, about an 85% cure rate. I don't have my patients take two grams at one time. 15 to 25% of them throw up. It's not great. I still, unfortunately, give them a refill for, them, for their partner to take. It really doesn't help, but I, I grew up at an S. I t you know, did, did, uh, had to do an STD rotation and, uh, for a couple of months in, in Boston. And, and, uh, and, uh, and so you know, they tell you, you, know, you can't get rid of it you help the partner, but you really can't get rid, rid, rid of it unless you help the partner and you help the partner's partner and then the partner's partner. And I remember one time I, I had a woman, she had, she had trichomonas, and, and um, I said, I'm sorry to say you have trick and she's an STD. And she says, yeah, 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 just give me my medicine. And I said, fine. I said, I'll give you, she's, I, she said, I see you're married. I can give you a prescription for your husband. She says, fine. And I says, oh, by the way, you know, I have a boyfriend. Could you give me a prescription for the boyfriend? And I said, oh, well, maybe I'll, I'll do, finally do something in my career and, and help this, 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 this group. It's not a couple. It's a group. And that was fine. But then the husband called me back and said, well, I have a girlfriend. Can you call me back? I said, you know, okay. I gave it to the girlfriend. The girlfriend called back and said she had a husband. I said, I, I went through eight generations and said, forget it. I, I'm not doing this anymore. So, uh, so also for medical legally, I gave a prescription for the, for the woman, because I don't know the husband. One, one time when I was in, in Atlanta, I gave a prescription to the husband. That's why I'm, we're talking about the dosage. She comes home, um, she, she, you know, uh, uh, and she takes her pill. She's thrown up. Husband comes home, and, and he says, what's the matter? He says, oh, we got trichomonas. The medicine made me sick. Here's your dose. He goes, fine, I'll take this later. You know? He put it in his pocket. He put it in his pocket, went out uh, drinking with his buddy because she wasn't any fun, you know, sitting there in, in, the, in the bathroom. Uh, had a few drinks on the way back, said, oh, she told me to take these pills. He was a little drunk. He forgot, you know, threw them in there. Started throwing up, you know, out the car window. Truck was a truck in, in Georgia. And he ran into a tree. And then, you know, I had a call from a lawyer, you know, well, your name's on his prescription. Forget it, you know, forget this anymore. Nothing happened, but I just, uh, I, you know, I, I stopped that. So I gave her a prescription in her name for refill. Said, if you happen to get this back, you know, th this is your, your dose again, but this will cure 84% of them. Uh, um, uh, but it is also a dose for, for males, for your husband too. You know, and, that's, and so I have him ask his doctor for this same dose, and they get the hands. Okay, now, CDC again, pregnancy. Just remember, again, for me, it's a couple of things I want you to remember. I do a lot of legal, legal work. I do only defense work, and I try to protect doctors. And there's a couple of things that CDC does that you don't really hear about, and that's why you come to these conferences. One is tenidazole is pregnancy C. It's, not, it's, it's a great drug. I use it for all my resistant, <coughs> resistant cases because the resistance is less than, one, less than 1%, where the resistance to metronidazole is about 16%. Uh, 
um, now. But it's category C, so do not try it in pregnancy. Okay, not a big sales force for the company, they don't tell you that stuff. Breastfeeding, it's also it's a longer acting dose, that's why it works better. If you're on metronidazole, still withhold the milk for 12, 24 hours after the last dose. And but with tinidazole, you gotta hold it for three days. So it's not a convenient dose for breastfeeding either. So for breastfeeding and for, for um, the pregnancy, don't use it if you don't have to. Every year at the, ba at the Baylor um, uh, Vaginitis Gardener course, there's a point counterpoint, a little discussion, and they always have me on the side of, of metronidazole during pregnancy, and I'm always on the anti. And I, I just don't like to give a lot of medication in pregnancy. Statistically, it's safe. The women who've taken metronidazole in pregnancy are, are typically healthier and have healthier babies, but that's because they're going to doctors. The ones who don't, you know, have other problems too. So treatment failures. What the CDC says, if you fail a metronidazole, give it for seven days, or basically give tinidazole. Again, resistance rate for metronidazole is about 16%. I was surprised when I was at, I was at, I was at the CDC in Atlanta. They had a big trichomonas, you know, it's the federal government. They have, they have a whole trichomonas section with a couple of people that sit there and all they do is study trichomonas. And they had thousands of trichomonas in the, in the freezer. And uh, we did susceptibility <coughs> in my lab. I have a lab. We did, and when their, their lab director um, got pregnant, uh, I ran the lab for a while. And we ran a couple of these. And since the government was paying for it, they ran, I ran a couple of, um, I ran 100 uh, uh, samples. And we found about a 16% relative, rel relative risk, a relative rate of resistance in metronidazole. Tinidazole, none. I have one patient that, that, that's failed tinidazole out of thousands over the years. And we eventually cured her just by acidifying her vagina because trichomonas are a bug that likes a high pH. Two grams a day, day single dose for five days if, 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 um, if they're, they seem to be recurrent. You really never, it's rarely you're gonna see a problem. If they're, if they're failing on tinidazole, Something else is going on. I used to always, th the reason I chest that is because when I had my metronidazole patients fail, I said, you're not taking your dose, you're getting it back, or you're throwing the dose up, or something's happening. Now, throwing up doesn't matter, because if they throw it up, that means they absorbed enough to make them nauseous, so they've got enough trichomonas, they've got enough metronidazole on board. And if, they're, and if they're getting reinfected, they tend to get better for a while and get reinfected, because it takes a while for them to grow. Uh, so some people say, I'm not having sex, I got rid of that guy, you know, that's it. And I take my medication, and I said, you know, maybe there is resistance, and there is. So if you see somebody that fails, it's not always that they weren't compliant. About 16% of the time, there's a relative resistance. Most of the cases, you increase the dose. I'd skip that. I go straight to tinidazole, and you'll get most of them. If they fail on tinidazole, it's rare, 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 rare. It happens once every five or ten years. It's going to happen more in the future, but uh, you hap ha that happens. There's something else going on. So again, trichomonas, easy to cure. If it, if it kind of goes away and comes back, or it doesn't go away entirely, switch to tinidazole. Tinidazole doesn't work. Just refer the patient out because there's something else going on. You can call me or the CDC again has their, a division on trichomonas. Okay, bacterial vaginosis. Now we're going from the easy to the hard. Bacterial vaginosis is hard because there's not a real diagnosis. There's not a real definition. There's an infectious disease society that I'm the president of the International Society. I'm a member of the American Society, but they but they don't really don't talk. And after Five years of saying we're going to merge the societies back again, we just said forget it. We're too far apart, and we're not going to, and we're not going to ever get back together again. The split occurred because of bacterial vaginosis. There's the Herman Gardner people, where Mrs. Gardner would invite you to the Christmas party if you called it by its real name, Gardnerella vaginalis vaginitis, uh, and if you called it BV, you wouldn't get invited to her party. And then there's the West Coast people that call it bacterial vaginosis because it's, uh, which technically is just a bacteria full of vagin vaginas, but it's not, but it's really a vagina full of bacteria. But it's an osis and not an itis. There's no white cells. So, you know, we are, and we argue over stupid things. We, I mean, we'll spend a day arguing over what, what the term bacterial vaginosis means, and, and that's why we don't meet anymore together. The, um, the uh, osis was because there are no white cells. Gardnerella makes succinic acid, which prevents the migration of white cells across the vaginal wall. So, it protects the Gardnerella because it prevents your body from immune system from developing an inflammatory response against it. Against it. That's why it's not bacterial vaginitis. It's a bacterial vaginosis. Uh, so as I'm going to show you some slides, if you see a patient with white cells, they either have a trichomonas, okay, trichomonas vaginalis vaginitis, or they have a yeast infection, candidiasis, or can candidal, can can candidal vaginitis, vulvovaginitis. You know, or you, can, or you have something else, which is going to be a bacterial vaginitis, which is one of the, you know, if there's no white cells, it's probably bacterial vaginosis. 
Gardnerella is a is is an aerobe. It's really a faculty of anaerobe. It's just like E. coli and Klebsiella. It's not an anaerobe, okay? But we give them anaerobic medication, metronidazole and clindamycin, to cure it. Why do we do that? Because Gardnerella is just a marker organism. The problem is the anaerobes. Um, uh, gram positives make an irritation and inflammation and itis, okay? Streptococcal pharyngitis, okay? The, uh, the gram negatives make pus, make, make inflammatory cells, make pus cells. That's why when you dip your urine, and it's usually E. coli is the infection, what you're dipping is you're looking for nitrites, but you're looking for leukocytes, and the leukocytes tells you there's a gram negative there uh, uh, for the most part. And then anaerobes make an odor. They put out putrazine cadaverine, and that's why they smell. The dead animal on the road smells because the anaerobes, there's no longer oxygen running through the, the, the tissues of the animal's body. The anaerobes then have a chance to grow. There's fresh meat, no oxygen, and it grows, and they start to smell. And it, 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 faculty, and, and it takes about 24 hours for that to really happen. And then you have um, uh, uh, putrescine and cadaver, and you have an odor. People with bac bacterial vaginosis uh, with BV, they, they, they come in, they say they have a discharge, and, then, and they have an odor. They don't come in and say, my pH is elevated, or I think I have clue cells. You know, they say they have an odor, which means that they're anaerobes. Okay? Clue cells are the Gardnerella, but they don't know that they have Gardnerella. They have anaerobes. And the bacteria, again, it's not a pus. It's, it's an it's, it's a overgrowth of bacteria. Not a little overgrowth of bacteria, 10,000% overgrowth of bacteria. So what's coming out are just pools and pools of, of, of bacteria. So when you give them, and those bacteria are predominantly anaerobes. So when you give them metronidazole or clindamycin, you don't kill the Gardnerella, you just kill the anaerobes. So their odor goes away, and you kill the majority of the bacteria so the discharge is better, so they think they're cured. And what happens? Almost everybody, 75% of the patients, 80% of the patients, one to three months later, the process starts all over again. Because the Gardnerella is there, makes succinic acid, the bacteria grow, the pH is high, the pH is still high. The same thing happens. The, again, the California people and the Texas people argue uh, because they say that 40% of women who've had BV before can have Gardnerella as a normal pathogen. It's not a normal pathogen. It's another BV infection waiting to happen. Um, and um, and uh, you can have gonorrhea in your cervix and no symptoms and no pain. doesn't mean you're not infected. You're infected, you know, and eventually... You know, it can become a problem. You can treat it, but you know, you know. But if it just is, but so BV, Gardnerella in your vagina, you could be asymptomatic, but you're not going to be. You're probably not going to be asymptomatic forever unless you do something else. So what happens is, with the patients that really do have bacterial vaginosis, they feel better. And these are the patients who say, I got better when you gave me the metronidazole, you know, and then, and but then it came back three weeks later or a month later. In fact, if you're, I'm on the FDA committee for this and we changed the recommendations a few years ago for approval for a drug, if you can just give us a 25% cure rate, you get approval for a BV treatment. 25%, that's all you gotta get. That's the standard. So metronidazole, I like metronidazole gel. If you just want my, my personal preference, again, this is CDC. I like the gel, and the, but the company, they don't, they're not, it used to be 3M. They don't like, the reason I like the gel, I like the gel because this stuff doesn't really do anything, and if you're gonna do something, if you're going to do, 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 do something, you might as well do the least amount of some, cause the least amount of trouble. So this is the safest one that, that has the, they're all equally ineffective. So they don't like that recommendation. Uh, metronidazole, again, a lot of pill just to get 1% in your vagina because 1% is all it takes to kill. Metrogel is fine. The reason I like the metrogel is clindamycin cream is clindamycin kills gram-positive <coughs> anaerobes and gram-positive, so it's great for strep, and I use a lot of it for strep. But it also kills lactobacilli. The metronidazole doesn't. So if you take the metrodidazole and they have some lactobacillus left, and it's a, I'll show you, it's, a, it's kind of a curve between lactobacillus and everything else, then they have a better chance of getting better. You give them clindamycin, you wipe out 40% of them, and you wipe out their lactobacillus forever, for, until you try to fix it. And then they go ahead, and they're the ones that get the problems over and over again. They have the bad problems, and they're the ones that see me. I can basically, just because I know what people have used and what you're limited to using, is have somebody come in, get a history, and say, you know, you've got a lactobacillus absent, you know, bacterial infection, because I see white cells. Alternate regimens, clindamycin, Dobbigan. Oral is okay, because only 1% gets to the vagina. It doesn't kill your lacto as well. It doesn't work as well. There's some other recommendations. But again, all you're doing is you're getting rid of the discharge, and you're not curing the problem. So frequent recurrences. Again, I like the gel, 
Sobel, Sobel and I have done some studies. We did the, the fluconazole study for once a week of fluconazole. If you, but that's only if you really have candida albicans, which is sensitive to fluconazole, you can use the, candid, the fluconazole once a week for six months, and it'll alleviate the infection, the yeast, inf the recurrence of the yeast infection. And then you haven't changed your habits. You know, wash your hands before, it, wash your fruit before you eat it. Wash your hands. Cut down on your your your, your bread, and uh, you can help them out a lot. For the bacterial vaginosis, he's done a study which I really didn't like because again, you're not really curing the patient and curing the problem. But, but Sobel's a ni nice guy. We get along. We're always in the same committees together. Uh, but he's not an OBGYN. He's an internist, internal medicine that specializes in HIV in men. Uh, and men. But he's but he's a brilliant yeast guy. And so he, no one, none of the OBGYNs want to do the study because we don't want our patients on metrogel uh, uh, twice a week for six months. But it works. It keeps, it keeps the anaerobes down, keeps the discharge and the odor away, and the patients feel better. But it, again, you're really not addressing the problem. Again, this is all CDC stuff. In pregnancy, again, I don't like metronidazole in pregnancy. You can use the clindamycin. Do not use the cream. The cream in two studies, because it killed your lactobacillus, allowed everything else there to grow. It was group B strep was not great, although you discover it when you screen. It was E. coli. You don't screen for E. coli, so they had E. coli, uh, e. coli problems, and there was a 50% increase in preterm labor and neonatal death with clindamycin cream. You cannot use clindamycin cream in pregnancy, okay? Maybe early, but in the studies, they're all, they wait till 16 to 20 weeks because the FDA uh, and the NIH said nothing in the first trimester. So just don't use clindamycin cream in pregnancy. It's not, you know, there's the 12, 15% chance of preterm labor in, in the entire population uh, out there, you don't want this to be, a, be an issue. And it's addressed to the CDC every year. Okay, so now we're done with the, the hard cases of the routine diagnoses. The recurrent, the, the resistant yeast, the resistant metronidazole, and the BV, what's really happened with BV. Now there's a whole bunch of differential diagnoses, and that's your contact deforation, your like, you know, dermatitis, your lichen planus, your vulvodynia, and your, your cancer. I mean, I, I'm probably once a month have a 45 or 55 year old woman come in that's referred to me for severe vulvovaginitis and I look at her and I know it's cancer or it, luckily it's usually just severe uh, vulvar dysplasia. But it's v VIN3 and they need something done. So you see somebody that's been treated for a while or it's one of your patients that's come back over and over again, in the back of your mind, just do a biopsy. Uh, uh, and and uh, again, when I was in medical school, the uh, average age of a person with vulvar carcinoma was 56. Uh, in the 1990s, it went down the, uh, to, to 48. Uh, it's now down the, to uh, uh, 42. Okay, so premenopausal women are having vulvar dysplasia. It has to do with HPV, uh, and the vaccine helps. Okay, bacterial, if you're, if you're gonna ro rule out vulvar uh, symptoms, the number one, again, 92% are normal, 8% are abnormal. Out of that 8%, 6% are streptococcal infections. Uh, Again, we, I, I'm trying to write the paper. I've got 300 patients now. You know, we'll change the standard of care over the years. The new the, the diagnosis criteria in my paper, <coughs> you know, for ACOG is going to be almost like the, the AMSOL criteria. It'll be you check your pH. It has to be greater than 4.5 because it's a bacterial infection. Um, you, uh, you're not going to have odor. You don't need to have the odor because it's not an anaerobic infection. It's a streptococcal infection. You need to see lots of bacteria on your wet prep, instead of, instead of clinging to the cells, which are the Gardnerella, because of the, because of the uh, polarity, these are just lots of, you know, cocci all over the place. Uh, you have to see white blood cells, which makes it an, an, an itis. Strep likes to, 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 to be an inflammatory and cause an itis. When I do gold culture for every other bacteria, I put it on a plate, I look at a colony growing on top, I take that colony off, and I test it. For strep, you hold it up to the air, and you see the holes through the through the media, you know, and if it's clear, totally clear, it's a group A, it's totally, it's not so clear, it's a yellow, it's group B, and then it's group, group uh, you know, uh, D and, and G. So streptococcal infection is very inflammatory. I ask my patients five things every time. Itching, burning, discharge, odor, or irritation. And the irritation, I say, burning's like I put, le if I put lemon juice down there. Irritation is like it's a raw feeling. The women who come in and say, you know what, I can't wear jeans. Every time I wear jeans, it's, I get this, this, the, you know, this itchy feeling. And I say, is it itchy or is it kind of a raw feeling? And they go, yeah, I guess. It's, is it burning like, like, uh, like lemon juice? And they go, no, no, it's, it's irritation. It's hard for them to descri describe. But irritation is a bacterial infection, usually a strep infection. I can, see, I can tell what most patients have before I, see, before I see them. Cytolytic vaginosis, we'll talk about. That's your grandmother. 
whose natural response before there were antibiotics and all this monostatin and everything else is they, she didn't suffer all her life. She made more lactobacillus, got more lactobacillus. She probably douched with yogurt. Don't have your patient douche with yogurt. There's no lactobacillus in there. There's 10 times more sugar than there was 20 years ago. And I can tell a patient that's douched with yogurt. She walks in and she's got redness and irritation down to her knees. And I say, oh, you use yogurt. She goes, how do you know? You know, I said, because all you did is feed the bacteria and it drips out and everything. It's, it's, it's all over the place. Herpes a little bit, warts and, and cervicitis we'll talk about later. So I get a history, you know, I, I find out is it, is it recurrent or is it persistent? You know, what makes it feel better? What, what, uh, what makes it uh, get worse? We're not talking about just routine infections. So I look at the vaginal exam and I just do a quick, quick exam, health exam. Again, no water in the speculum, pH is seven. I get the pH from the fornices. Uh, uh, I'd be careful if I'm using some lubrication, a thin layer of lubrication. I don't take a cervical a cerv a pH of the cervix because it's a pH of seven. Uh, I have a swab, uh, a, saline, a saline tube, a tube with saline at one cc only because in the nurse the other day, she's a new nurse, she only put a half a cc in there. So things like I said, wow, she's twice as bad as she was last time I saw her because I do a relative one, two, three, four plus. And she wasn't twice as bad. She just had half the saline, so it looked like she had twice as many cells. So one cc of saline, try, it's not an exact science, but it's first having a drop on the saline or slide or just taking the the, uh, the, the Q-tip directly versus having three or four cc's in there. And then I take cultures. I do cultures, we'll talk about it, it's hard to do cultures, but that's a whole lecture on that. I go to the wet prep, I do the KOH, the wet prep, and the wet test and the gram stains. I do gram stains, everybody, because I'm a microbiologist, I like doing it. Okay, you're not gonna do it, but just to give you a relative idea, this is a fairly normal patient. She had an infection, that's why she's coming back for test to cure for me. Uh, and I probably, she probably only see six or seven lacto in the slide. She has more because her body, while I was curing her, was also reacting uh, to, to her infection. And, but it's, 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 rel it's relatively going down. And then I get her, and I, did, and I have this little sheet I do with wet prep. And she's got some white blood cells, no hyphae, no yeast cells, no trick, no lacto. Again, we did the normal infections. Now we're going to go to the 8% that are abnormal. But it just gives you an idea of what you got, got on that. Lots and lots of cocci. Uh, a few rods going on there. I'm, ho I'm hoping they're lacto. No whiff, no clue and kind of a thin beige yellow discharge. She said it's itching greater than burning, but it's really irritation. But she just, I just can't, it's hard to get. When you look under the microscope, she's got all that stuff. It's protonaceous material. Gram positives, streptococci, they make an exotoxin. That's why you get toxic shock from staph and, and, and you can get a toxic strep that's flesh-eating bacteria because they make a toxin. There's no second silicon wall with the gram negative, so all this stuff goes out and it, and, it, and it agglutinates and it's protein and it sits there and she's got big white cells all over the place. I mean, the report will come back from your lab. Again, we'll talk more about it later. The report will come back from your lab, normal vaginal flora, because they're allowed to do that. They don't have to, they, just like they don't have to culture uh, a, throat, a throat culture, or if you're looking for a sputum for pneumonia and they see a lot of squames in there from the throat, they don't have to culture it. They don't have to set it for culture, they don't have to culture it. You do a gram stain, see lots of bacteria, there's lots of bacteria that are supposed to be in the vagina, and they call it normal, back, normal flora. And don't tell your patients it says you're normal. It must, you won't do this. It must be in your head. We try, try something else, try something else. They have, if you look under the microscope, and there's not five or six lactobacillus there, and everything else is clear, okay? If it's not that, she's got something. It doesn't make a difference what the laboratory says. And when you culture her out, she's got pure group B strep. And in my lab, I asked them to get Tell me if there's lactobacillus there, because if there's lactobacillus there, I want to encourage its growth back. If there's none, I can give her anything to cure it. I give her, you know, I give her amoxicillin. We get rid of the strep. The problem is it, it would kill lacto if it's there. She has no lacto, and I got to start all over again. And I, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you how to do, do that also. So bacterial vaginitis, you see white cells. It's no longer a bacterial vaginosis. And again, you see a patient, you don't see yeast, you don't see trick. What are you going to call her? Okay. Don't, just don't listen to the lab. She's not normal. You see that there's, it's not normal. You can see it. It's plain as day. And, you know, remember, six or seven, the pH scale, bacteria live in a range of five to eight. The, that's why your vagina is 4.2, because if it's 4.2, then you, bacteria that get in your vagina from your underwear, from your, from your pants, from your hand, from your husband, it doesn't grow because the bacteria get in there and say, oh, the pH is 4.2. I can't grow in a pH under five. It's not a little change in pH. The pH is a Richter scale. 
7 is not 1 different than 6. It's 10 times more acidic at 6. It's then 100 times more acidic at 5. It's 1,000 times more acidic at 4. Okay? So you have a big difference in your acidity. So uh, your patients, if their pH is over 4.5 or 5, bacteria will grow like crazy. So you have an inflammatory bacteria. You can get your culture. You know, I don't wait, but, and I get a culture. They'll get you your group B strep with group B strep now because they know how, the labs know how to do it because they do it for pregnancy. So you'll generally get a report. It gen sometimes I say normal vaginal flora, but if it's strep, they'll give you a report. I give them clindamycin vaginal cream. As much as I don't like it in pregnancy for BV, it gets gram positive really well. I don't have to give them amoxicillin. Uh, Ofloxacin, levofloxacin, or stu the studies we did, they worked fine. It's just very expensive, some of the, the, um, the um, lat for, for the insurance companies. Cipro seems to work just as well. It also doesn't kill lacto. And in, in Oklahoma, for the past couple of years, it's basically free. You can go to Reason and get it for free because it's that cheap. It's one of those come in, get a free prescription. They tell, tell you it takes 20 minutes, even though it's there already bottled on the side because they want you to shop around. And I spent $50 in the grocery store while I'm waiting for my free, free Cipro. But Cipro works fine. That's why make sure they're not pregnant. Okay, twice a day for five days, it works just fine. The problem is you get rid of the strep, okay? And again, I like clindamycin and Queen is my first, first choice. It gets rid of the strep. But you haven't solved the problem because now she has no bacteria. So if there's yeast, you'll get a yeast infection. 40% of the time, remember, that with clindamycin, you'll get a yeast infection because you're, you did have lacto, you're eliminating it. And then unless you get her lactobacillus back, which she can try by eating yogurt, but again, 90% of yogurts don't have stuff in it. And how much yogurt can she eat in the five days or seven days you're getting in treatment? And then what happens is the first thing grows back, grows back, and it's usually the strep or something else again. So we'll talk about how to do that. Another patient, 5.1. We're, um, we're going to be done in a minute. 5.1, two, um, uh, two plus white, lots of white cells. I think I see some yeast cells. I don't see any lacto. Uh, I see lots of cocci. And basically see this. Again, this report always comes back normal vaginal flora. This is not normal. Remember what normal looks like. This is not normal. She's got some yeast cells that are starting to bud, so I know it's a can of the albicans. They're kind of dying because there's an inflammatory response. Uh, lots of other bacteria on. This is not normal. I mean, and what do you do with this patient? You know, you give her flagell, and she doesn't have an odor. She may not get better. It looks like a clue cell starting over there on the left. Okay, so it's hard, but there's white cells. So it's not a typical, typical anything. She turns out to be yeast infection. She's got white blood cells because she's got a yeast infection, and she's got a candidiasis, candida, candida vag vulvovaginitis, and she's got a Gardnerella infection that's starting. So she's in that phase where things are starting to change. The only way to cure her is you gotta give her something to get rid of the Gardnerella. Got Gardnerella is not an anaerobe. You have to give her, it's like E. coli. You think of it like, like E. coli. You gotta give her, I give, her, I give these patients Cipro. Um, you can give them Keflex, but Keflex kills the lacto. Uh, so Cipro won't kill, the, won't kill the lacto, which there aren't any there anyway. And I give her yeast medication at the same time. And she gets better after you know, two years of this or nine months of this, they get better right away. Another, PA, another quick patient, because I want to go through it. TG looks like a Torilopsis glabrata to me. Uh, maybe some lacto, not much of anything else. The lacto, the yeast won't grow unless it doesn't have any competition with bacteria. So when I see low bacteria, so I think about yeast. Again, but 50% of the time, no matter what you do, you're not going to find the yeast. So I look at the, the microscope, and there she has yeast cells, Torilopsis glabrata cells going there. Not much bacteria in the background. When we get a culture, it's Torilopsis glabrata. A little bit of enterococci. She just happened to have, you know, some enterococci there. Enterococci, group D strep, not a bad problem. I don't treat that right away because I give her amoxicillin to treat that. Like the lab tells you to give her amoxicillin. I don't because then I'm just going to make her lacto worse. And notorialopsis gabrata is the main problem. Okay. Last uh, slide like this. I didn't have KOH that day. The nurses ordered the wrong thing. A few white blood cells, you know, but I see lots of cocci and lots of rods. And it's a bacterial infection. You see this. The lab. 100% of the time, we'll report this as normal vaginal flora. They see these things that look like uh, rods. It must be lactobacilli. Um, I gram stain these myself. I didn't do a good job gram staining, and I do hundreds of these, if not thousands of these. Uh, and she's got white blood cells. And again, she's got pure E. coli, pure Klebsiella. You know, they, don't get, they never get cured on clindamycin. They never get cured on metrogel. They feel a little better on clindamycin from metrogel because you're coating the vagina and you're washing away with the, dish, with the thing, but they don't, get, they don't ever get better. 
So this lady gets, gets, gets Keflex or, or Cipro. I like Cipro if they're not pregnant. We then got to recolonize her lactobacilli, and they do fine after you know, 9, 10, 12 months of this stuff. 4.7, crooked lactobacilli, little erythema. Again, we see this. This is not normal. Remember, it's six or seven, and these reports come back normal vaginal flora, mixed flora, mixed bacteria. Okay? This is not normal. This is why your patients are suffering, and they say, I get this over and over again, I'm taking all these things, I'm not getting better. But the labs that we'll talk about the last lecture, the labs aren't going to help you. You're stuck. But you see this, you know something else is going on. Okay? For her, I'm lucky enough I've got a lab. I, I'm, I'm going to finally try to get DLO and the other labs to, to, to do this for everybody. It's just hard because they don't have to, and, and, and they don't want to because it's expensive for them. Uh, this patient has lactobacillus and Gardnerella. Again, we're running out of time. You're going to see patients that, are, these are your normal, this is a normal BV patient, but is she a BV patient that's increased her lacto? Because, you know, 1950, 1945, everybody, you know, there's BV around, but not, not everybody dies. You don't hear about this all the time because your body will take the lactobacillus. It'll see there's something foreign there. It'll try to get rid of it. It may take three months, you know, and in the meantime, if it's 1950, the woman's douching, which is helping the encourage the pH is low, encouraging lactobacilli. Before they said douching is bad, and it's not really bad. We won't go there right now. Uh, but you don't know where you are in this graph. Is she a BV patient that's going to get worse, or is she a BV patient that was worse and getting better? Is her lactobacillus winning? It just takes a couple of weeks. You don't know. I don't take. The, I, don't, I just. I don't take. I don't need to take a chance. I know what she is. She's a Gardnerella. I get rid of the Gardnerella. I encourage the lactobacillus to go back. And again. Um, not many white blood cells, lots of rods. You see this, again, you see these, the main point is you look under the microscope. If it's not crystal clear, a few lacto, there's something wrong, and she's not going to get better until you figure it out. And you don't necessarily, you're not going to get help with your lab. You know, I'll try to help you, but you're not going to help your lab. You can kind of get an idea uh, just by looking at lots of bacteria. You know, Cipro's safe, clindamycin cream, you know, you know a few things, uh, and then culture, look for yeast. This is a strep and a gardener of vaginitis. You know, and these are just what I see every day. I see three or four of these you know, recurrent patients have a mixture, and there's no way it really can help you. So treatment, the end, the end, here's what you do. One, number one, you can't get your lactobacillus back in list to acidify. So as soon as they leave the office, I have them acidify. I used to have them, all my patients, vinegar douche. Vinegar douche is going to save. The woman who did the study, um, I just showed that douching was bad, was an epidemiologist. And we argued with her in the society years after year, year after year after year, because you know you got to acidify, and we like douching. But she found that patients who had BV or douche a lot got PID. Well, of course they did, because they have gonorrhea. They have something wrong with them. They, ha they don't want to go to the doctor to get the cure, to get, get the shot. They don't have the money. So what they do is they do what their mother told them and their grandmother told them, is they douche. And they douched a little bit, or they douched a lot. And if you douched a lot and didn't go to the doctor, eventually, you got upper genital tract infection and you got sick. So when they did the study, you'd say, wow, there's an association with people who douche and PID. Well, of course there is, because there's something wrong with them. If you took a woman who had nothing wrong with them and just douched because their mother said it's good to do that once a month, there was nothing wrong. So they, she redid the study. Of course, we asked for the grant, but they gave it to her since she did the first study. The study came out and showed there was no difference with douching and, and, and PID and BV. And we said, great, you know, Roberta, why don't you go ahead and publicize that now? She goes, no, I'm not going to publicize that I was wrong the first time. She says, you do that. So I said, yeah, that's what we're doing now. Uh, and the newspapers, and I call up and said, yeah, this is an important announcement. They go, you know, good news is not news. You know, so you haven't heard about it. But it's everything's in the literature. You're, I don't want to argue. I tell my patients to do state now. They go, oh, no, I heard it's bad. Instead of arguing with them, acid gel. It's a prescription product made by Hope Pharmaceuticals. You tell them to use an applicator in the vagina three times a week. The, 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 the manufacturer tells you to use it every day for a month because they just want you to buy a lot of it. You just need it three times a day per month. All you need is your vagina acidified when that lactobacillus is coming out of your rectum and getting into your body uh, from the stuff you ate. So I'd have them do that. Your pharmacist, first thing the pharmacist does, you know, get little tricks of the trade, is going to say, I don't carry that. We, they don't make it anymore. I call the pharmacist back, you're a liar and you're lazy. I said, they said, there's a thousand things they can carry in their pharmacy, all the big pharmacies. This is like a thousand and two, so they don't carry it. They have to order it, it has to come in the next day, or two days from now, they don't make a big profit margin off of it, so they don't like to do it. So they'd rather you go someplace else. So my nurses are sick and tired. That's why I got to get this website going to get the ph get the pharmacies that that will distribute. It's out there. You can buy it. There's two manufacturers. You just tell the tell it. I just I just told them you're lazy. Go find it. You know, or go to Rite Aid. Rite Aid has it now. It, it depends. It's all regional. So I have them do that once. An applicator 
three times a week uh, for three weeks, then two times a week for two weeks, then one time a week for two weeks, for, for three weeks. You know, so three times for three weeks, two times for two, three weeks, and one time for three weeks, a do a dosing regimen. Uh, and hopefully in that time they get their, their lactobacillus back. Lactobacillus, fresh yogurt, you know, fresh meaning you buy one, because it only lives three days and it's probably been sitting on the shelf two days. And make the, 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 uh, uh, the uh, grocery store people crazy, go through the front, get in the back, get the freshest date. Even with that, 10% chance there's anything in there. So it's going to take 10 times the number of weeks that doses per week you, t you, you get fresh yogurt. So it's going to take a couple, of, a couple of weeks or a couple of months to get some lactobacillus back in your system. Uh, they say, well, they come in a six pack. Yeah, well, the, the next five aren't going to be any good. Fine, you can eat them, but they're not going to help you. So they got to get the lactobacillus back. And then while they're getting lactobacillus back in their intestines and they're trying to recolonize the vagina, then you find out, I get cultures. You may not be able to get cultures. I'll try to help you over the next year. Again, once they get this website stuff straightened out, I'll send you the information. Then you get rid of whatever else is there. Again, it looks like a bunch of gram positives. Think of a thing that's strep, use clindamycin. If it looks like a bunch of gram negatives and the lab's telling you it's, it's lack, lots of lacto and mixed flora, it's being confused with mixed flora because it's a, it's a rod. Think Cipro. Uh, and then, and then uh, uh, give them a short course of that. And that's how you treat them. Okay. Only last thing I just want to end off. People are generally healthy. And you get somebody who comes in and her pH is way low. So I said, wow, this is not a bacterial vaginal infection. A little bit of white blood cells, lots and lots and lots of lacto. That's a normal person. She has an infection. Her body is reacting against it. And what she does is she makes more lacto. Uh, and, and again, this is the normal. Again, it's two or three times more. Is that important? Yeah, two or three times more. Uh, if seven lacto gives you a pH from seven to six to five to four, you know, three times the lacto is going to get your pH down to 3.5 and it'll get rid of yeast and bacteria. Usually with this, it's a chronic yeast infection. These are the patients that come in and have the itching all the time and they think it's, it's a, what she has is a yeast infection, usually. Can be a bacterial infection or she took some antibiotics recently, but usually it's yeast infection. So I go out and, and I haven't played golf here, but I'm a pro golfer <coughs> and I grab some poison ivy uh, and I let go. I don't say, oh, thank God I let go, I'm okay now. I got a reaction for three weeks, okay? If I go to my dermatologist and show him, he'll say, it kind of looks like poison ivy, but I don't know. Unless I have it in my hand, he's got to guess. These patients with lots and lots of lacto, with low pH that have discharges, usually it's burning, uh, a little bit of irritation. They have these yeast infections every two or three weeks. You culture them, it comes back negative, because they only have yeast in their body one, two, three days a month. So the other 27 days, you're getting negative cultures. But it's yeast. So, it's, so if I went out and played golf, grab the, grab the, uh, hit the ball, slice it off the right, go in the same bushes, grabbed it, two weeks later, grabbed it again, two weeks later, grabbed it again, I'd have a chronic you know, infection or chronic reaction on my skin for three months. And that's what these are. They're just recurrent. The dermatologist, give them six months of Diflucan, okay? Which is great, but then when that stops working, then they come to me because they have a Toriolopsis librata. But this is usually an intermittent yeast infection. And then, so for these patients, you can, I can make them feel instantly better by deacidifying them. So I just have them use KY jelly. So again, douching, for me it's douching with baking soda. You know, again, it's hard to, you gotta get the patient to sign a consent and all kinds of stuff because they're afraid of douching. But just um, put KY jelly. When they get the, they, they're the ones say, when I get in the bathtub, it feels great because they're washing off all the extra acid. And again, it's like 300% more acid. Uh, and you can give them clindamycin. The really bad cases, I give clindamycin cream because it kills it. I don't want to kill it because there's something that causes the increase, and it's usually yeast. But th these patients, I tell them, get their cheapest over the counter yeast product, seven days, it's fine. But just use it once a week. Just use the seven day monostat one day a week for the next three months, and they feel better. And that's it. Okay, that's what normal is.